I'm Shivani Gupta and welcome to the Ask Shivani Podcast. I believe that one of the best presents that you can give yourself is time to be able to sit down and ask yourself some questions. I believe that the quality of the questions that you ask yourself will determine the quality of your life. Welcome to the Ask Shivani Podcast. I'm so excited to have Sarah Maxwell today. I recently got to meet Sarah and um, fascinating, fascinating background. So let me tell you a little bit about her, even though I'm not going to do it justice. So Sarah came, comes from Frosty Canada and she, um, she talks about how somehow she became a beach volleyball player and she represented Canada for nine years. That's, that's almost a decade. She then moved to um, Australia with the team in 2000 and she's been coached by some of the world's best uh, coaches um, and it's ranked in the top 10 worldwide. She also then ended up marrying Australian five-time Olympian and gold medalist Natalie Cook and they have a beautiful uh, four-year-old daughter. After retiring, she's done some amazing stuff. She's got a bio uh, psychology degree. Um, she's become an NLP certified trainer. She's got a developed her own game space research. She's led couples workshops and corporate team developments and change management. Um, and she's never ever left the passion that she's had for her sport. Uh, and now she also works um, with the Australian archery team going to that, that led into the London 12, 2012 um, and also created a wellness app. Uh, again, the list is very long, but I just wanted to do um, a very quick intro and welcome Sarah. Oh, thank you. What a good excuse to chat to you. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for making the time. Now, there's been so many things when I read that out in the CV and I probably left half of it out. Take us through a bit of your journey, maybe the big highs and the big lows, you know, all those transformational moments that have got you to where you have today. Take us through some of that. Well, sometimes I find that challenging, actually, that question, because I don't know if you feel this, Shivani, but it's like I've lived many lives. It almost feels like sometimes I can't remember it. And so, you know, when you do bios or you submit a CV or something, or you looked at your LinkedIn profile, it's like, oh, yeah. So look, ultimately, now I'm looking with a bit of a bigger lens, obviously, because some of the things were just happening in the moment. But coming from Canada, I was always the little girl who had big dreams, and they were always around sport. Um, and it was very clear to me that, like, this is what I wanted to do. I'd be out on the picnic table in the backyard like practicing backflips and all these moves. And then when I got into soccer, I'd be like, practice, practice, practice. And it was really, um, I always had a really intense drive. And I never thought that a girl couldn't do it. Um, it was interesting that our team became some of the first professional female athletes in Canada. And I just use the word professional because we actually got paid to play. and. I think that I really attribute that to my mom because my mom was a feminist and what she did was she really embodied this idea that anything was possible. And we've had challenges, her and I, but more and more I recognize how deeply incredible that was. The fact that I always believed it was possible. I didn't even think I had to battle. Um, that just brought up the fact that I, with her, we used to play baseball. And for some reason, we start a baseball, not softball. And, oh, yeah, there's no other girls playing. Huh. How can I be the best at this sport? You know, and so I just remember it was me and my mom and all the boys and their dads. For some reason, all the dads brought their boys. And so there was a little bit, you know, started a bit later that we would sort of, um, what's the word for that? A little bit more battling or hustling a little bit with my mom. But there was a real deep solid ingrained belief that I'm a person and a person can do whatever they want and so I think in some ways that led to a really dreamy life where you know I went to university I got a, a degree and all that kind of stuff but again I was like I just want to do sport and there was a lot of challenges because because I had that dream and I was so clear when I got knocked back from the indoor national team, I made part of the team and not the bigger team that I wanted to. And th this is something um, that's really interesting about dreams is that 
when I arrived, I'll never forget like the first day of the national team training camp. And there was this athlete there from another country who had immigrated to Canada. And I just mentioned that because she had a really full on personality. And we had this guy, this like um, mental trainer speak to us. I was almost crying. I was so inspired. I was like, wow, you know, and he was really wanting to rejuvenate the Canadian spirit and what we believed was possible. And I was just like so into it. And this athlete, when that guy left the room, she turned to all the athletes and she said, what a crock. Like, I'm not going to swear, but you know, she was like, she just like blew it all down. And here I was like new athlete, young. And I just felt that, oh, this isn't the dream. This is not what I thought it was going to be like. I thought it was going to be like the guy and everything he just talked about. So it, it was a really interesting moment. It was the first time in my life where I thought, oh, perhaps this isn't exactly how the dream is going to manifest. And, and so I ended up, you know, heading into beach volleyball and, and, you know, kind of shifting the focus a little bit, but that was something that to this day, I often help other people with as well. But in myself, I say that sometimes what I thought the dream was going to be, I always believe it has the same like vibration, if you will, like the same flavor but it looks slightly different because I feel like as humans, I was a little girl, I could only imagine as much as I could imagine. And so this is making me want to share this story that when I went to see Oprah speak in Brisbane year, like so many years later, when I just had my daughter, she, she told this incredible story about her and her grandmother hanging out clothes on the clothesline. And her grandmother telling her that one day she was going to get to work for a really great white family like she was. And Oprah remembered thinking, I'm not going to work for any white family. She was thinking more about who's going to be working for me. But she did say that she looked out into the oak trees. They had an oak tree. And she just remembered thinking, one day I'm going to have a beautiful oak tree in front of my house just like that. And as she was telling us all this story in Brisbane, she said, and just a week ago before coming here, Stedman and I, her partner, were out having a tea at, I think, I want to say it's her Hawaii home, maybe. And she she said, she looked out and she said to Stedman, oh, look at the oak tree. But, but actually look at the hundred oak trees. And in that moment, she got that as the little girl, she could imagine one oak tree, but that the universe had a bigger plan for her. And it was like a field of oak trees. And that's what I sort of feel sometimes with my dream is that I dreamt as big as I could, but there was more for me. It was bigger. It was going to lead me to Australia. It was going to lead me to my daughter. It was going to lead me to my partner. It was going to lead me to our friendship. You know, it was going to lead me here, but I just... I just could only imagine as big as I could imagine. I love that, Sarah. Love that. That mm. is so beautiful. And I wasn't, wasn't in Brisbane, but I was at the Oprah in Sydney uh, okay. when she shared that story. And I remember that story. As soon as you started, I remembered that story. That is so stunning. And so with all the, the different changes that you've had in your um, career choices around sport, but also then moving to Australia and Doing that, you've obviously um, had a lot of training um, mentally and academically, and then you've utilised a lot of that work in your in your business as well as your personal life. Like, so when challenges come your way, whether it was the challenge around sport or moving here, like, how do you go about doing it? Do you have a process? Do you have a methodology? Do you sit and journal? Like, what do you do when stuff comes at you and you're trying to solve challenges? Yeah, it was great to hear you ask that because I will say the very first thing I observed and I'm, you know, me, I'm so like honest. I was like, but I never had any challenges. I felt that was so hard to answer. And I actually think that's potentially part of, maybe that's part of my structure. We can call it denial. (laughs) We could call it a lot of things, but I do find that question really difficult. Like, and Perhaps it's part of the process. It's like, I'm so designed to flip the thing. I'm like, I'm the biggest silver lining person. However, 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 I do remember growing up 
that I wasn't always positive. I was always, I was pretty dramatic and quite filled with angst. I was just noticing that I didn't actually tell you about this part. So this is good. When I was 14, I remember I spent a year sleeping on my mom's floor, like on the, in her bedroom, because I could not fall asleep without, definitely couldn't fall asleep if the rest of the house was asleep. So I made, I would have to go to bed an hour early, make sure I heard all the noise in the house. And, you know, ultimately I, you know, in retrospect, I think what was going on was, I call it angst versus anxiety because I don't want to um, diminish some of anxiety disorders, if that makes sense. So I'm just gonna use the word angst. But what that was, was consistent and cycling thoughts. <laughs> what I've realized, it's, it's actually my superpower, but at the time it wasn't. It's what made me go out on the picnic table and do a thousand jumps. It's what made me do those, all that kind of like training, dedication, committed behavior, but at night, going to sleep. It was really cyclical behavior. It was very much like if I got onto something, I couldn't let it go. I was just like, oh my gosh. And so I would call myself a definite overthinker. We, we also said, you know, I'm such an analyzer. And I would say my mom would admit and say she was the same. She also analyzed things. And so here we were analyzing the heck out of everything. And so I, I give that example because it led me to almost all that study that I did. I was so um, curious about the mind. I was like, what makes me crazy like this, you know? And so as a 14 year old, I've attracted a lot of 14 year old or parents with 14 year old girls into my life, I think, because I went through that period. But one of the things, and by the way, it didn't happen from like when I was 15, it went away. But what happened more like when I was at university, I had this little bout of this period where I was so low and, and I remember feeling like really out of sorts and it really didn't match my life because I had a great life, but in my head, I didn't. And so my mom, you know, I remember my mom sending me the package with St. John's Ward in it. And, you know, this is, you're going to start taking this. And I remember this moment. Now, this is just... Um, there's no right or wrong here. This is what I chose to do. I remember in that moment saying, I don't want to take this for the rest of my life. So what am I going to do? It can't, I can't stay the way I am, but I'm not taking this. So the journey began. What is this mind thing? What's going on? And, you know, yes, my degree is in biopsychology. It is a study of the mind. It was more like the chemicals of the brain which to be honest, at the end of the day, I was like, oh, that's not really what I want to know about. I was really interested in human behavior. I really wanted to understand, you know, the one thing that I, from my degree that I loved was biofeedback, this idea that we could interact with our chemistry, you know, our behaviors could alter it like that. I was down for, and I graduated in 2000. So things, the advancements in understanding around neuropsychology, the brain are just like, we didn't even know that you could cross the blood brain barrier yet. Like that's just wild because there's just so many advancements even around this idea of biofeedback. So anyway, I'm on a tangent. So back to thoughts. In my career in volleyball, where most people were just training, I was like, we brought a meditation coach on tour. You know, we had energy healers. I was just on retreat with some people that you know, Shivani, and I was sharing with them how this energy guy got me and my beach partner out on the sand. And he's like, um, I'm just going to do some energetic testing with you. And he tested me and he's like, okay, so you're at your weakest when you're standing in sand. I'm like, awesome. I'm a professional beach volleyball player, you know, like, come on. And so then he, we would step into the water and he'd be like, yeah, much stronger here. I'm like, no, come on. So, so this is this wild journey where he was treating us for like energy around sand and my jumping changed significantly, but other players were probably working on their calves and doing more squats. Yeah, we did those too, but we were investigating a deeper realm, you know, and all back to this thinking. So when I'm challenged, I have shifted from thinking about the thing, to be honest, I stopped journaling. It's really interesting because people, Oprah in particular, who I love, 
um, encourages journaling. Lots of people journal to great success. My mom journals every single day for her entire life and burns them, which is, you know, so it's like journaling's a thing. For me, journaling and being an overthinker didn't go that well. I just ruminated. Interesting. So, yeah, it was inter- it is interesting. I think about it a lot because I think there still could be a place for it. But I could see that as I became more mindful, which was like I started practicing the breath. Um, I did like, you know, 10 days, no talking, noble silence. And it's just like blew my mind. Um, you don't have to be so intense, but I was intense. And now when I have a problem, I think I really come back to the breath. Um, You know, I've done lots of reading of Eckhart Tolle and I I really think about who's talking right now. Is this like my pain body talking? Is this, who am I? You know, I notice that I'm noticing, you know, I, I have a lot of inner reflection and I generally do that a lot before I ever come out. So I do have a big internal world. Um, and then I have noticed that I find it quite difficult to come out when I'm in the thing, you know, I'm not that good at being messy in front of everyone. I like to clean it up Shivani before I get out there, but this is again, not a right way. This is just sort of thus far how it's been. So, um, when I'm challenged, I think I go into a lot of these practices that have become more normative now, the breathing stuff, um, and I, I think there has become a flow state. I kind of noticed it a couple years ago, like maybe even 10 years ago. I thought to myself, oh, it's, it's just not as hard as it used to be. I just felt like I was working so hard at everything. And then it, it does feel like it's gotten a little bit easier. I really, really appreciate how much, like almost that journey that you went into in terms of sort of working that out. And when I was listening to your process, I love the fact that you said, I'm not sure if that's a process, but I just flip it. Like I've got this silver lining. I'm like, that's exactly your process. Your process is that you flip it. it. Okay. And then you go, okay, this is what I do. But just also this notion that when it starts off, it's not a habit yet, but it's almost like forms the, almost the, the way that you react to things is you go, oh yeah, I've done this a, in a million times so I can step into that. Mm. And Sarah, when I look at all the different things you've done. You've got a daughter, you and Nat have got a daughter. You've been doing quite a bit of of work. When you look at future aspirations, both work, business and personal, and whether you want to do a five-year timeframe, 10-year timeframe, like what are some of the future things you go, oh, I really want to do that or I want to achieve that or I want to be that. What are the things that come up around work or, or home in terms of your future aspirations? Well, I'm hoping this comes as a relief to some people, not much. And I'll just (laughs) like relax if you don't have a five-year plan, everyone. If you do, like, yay, because you'll be really much better at this question than me. However, what I have been working on is more the who am I, what are my values stuff, and allowing the next five years to come to me. So for example, the last year, I have been working really freaking diligently on not forcing my next step. And I am a pretty much, I'm pretty driven. And so I was observing how I would like, yeah, 2022 is a lot of start stops. Whereas normally I am like start, you know, like complete, go all the way. So to not, um, yeah, to stop, for example, is really unfamiliar. And so then I'm like, oh, now I'm uncomfortable, I'm not loving this. So I have been working really hard not to force. I read a book like a long time ago, but it's called Power Versus Force. I don't know if you've read it. It's quite a complicated book, but- No, I haven't. Do you know what? Don't read it, just the title. It's actually just like <laughs> the title, to be honest. And then all the science to prove it. So basically what it says, because it is, it's like a freaking hard read. So it's saying that, Every force has an equal and opposite counterforce. So now you don't have to read it. You're welcome. So it's like physics. And so I think about that with energy and my life. I'm like, if I force this, it's going to have a backlash. It's going to come back to haunt me. So I've been like, and look, I've, I've done a lot of different like um, therapies and courses. The woman I roomed with at this retreat was like, you've done a lot of things on yourself. I'm like, I know. No wonder. I've become so perfect. 
just kidding. So, so hold up. So back to the whole not forcing it bit is like, um, I've just been dropped this like opportunity. And it came like <laughs> without bells and without whistles. Like, so I've been working on who am I? What do I love? Like, and this is, I, I suppose this is even the message. I was like, do I even have a message these days? Like, what the heck do I want to share? The only thing I think I was wanting to share was this idea that there's always a trail. There's always like crumbs telling this story about what we love. And you know, this whole, I want to be on my purpose. Well, anyways, I do. I want fulfillment. Like this has always been kind of my message, living a fulfilled life. And I'm like, there's always clues. There's always crumbs, but sometimes I'm just too busy or chaotic to see them. And so I've been really looking at the crumbs lately instead of forcing. So the thing that dropped into my possibility, I'm like, oh my gosh. So it was a potential to go away for a month um, on a UN. So this is the thing. It was so interesting. It came in and it was to support an indigenous leader going to the UNCOP 27. I'm like, what? What's that? I was like, this is a massive acronym. I didn't even catch that it was the UN at the beginning. So then I was like Googling it. I'm like, oh, this is the climate change and listening to diverse voices around the world at the UN, what, in Egypt? Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is like this moment of real um, affirmation that not forcing it or just being very aware and almost at peak, like calmer and just allowing that to come, it came out of nowhere seemingly. And so allowing is something over the next five years versus um, now I am into manifesting. I don't want to um, like give the message that there's not power in being deliberate. So what I mean by that is like, I had written down things around culture, like all these things were written down, but I did not write down UNCOP. 27 Egypt. Now I did not write that down. So maybe it's the oak tree moment. I don't know. But um, over the next five years, I definitely want to be surrounded in purpose, like impact, making a difference in the world and a lot around culture, potentially refugee. You know, th this area is really interesting and always I'm always drawn there just because of my own Kind of background and things so um i suppose it's more like a, a theme versus a um written out goal yeah no that's and it's so great sarah because you know more and more people i'm speaking to are saying i don't do what i used to do so you don't journal anymore you're not saying hey here's this concrete path that i have to take like i'm going to let it come to me is what i heard and i love that i'm going to let the next five years come to me rather than than I go to eat um which is not easy for me bit. just saying like just so you know that's like a that's a change yeah yeah but that's part of that self-growth and development too isn't it saying um I know I know one of my words keywords this year is surrender which oh. I'm like yeah that's so lovely but I'm like oh my god it is so difficult to right. practice it so difficult to practice so lovely to sound the sound of it I'm going to surrender but I find practicing it really challenging Really oh, boom. exactly 100% yeah and so um what about um uh, your own wellness and I'm interested in your wellness rituals but also really interested in your mental wellness so what are some of the things that you do some whether it's daily monthly yearly I know you've just been on a retreat so do you do that once a year like tell us a bit about your rituals around wellness and practices but particularly also focusing on mental wellness I think my mental wellness in the past two, three years has been very centered around community. I have moved around a lot. I love adventure. I'm, I travel a lot. And I, I became very excited about my neighbors. <laughs> it's like, I am so pumped to be able to walk to my neighbor's house with my daughter's hand. Like, this is so exciting to me. Where some people's probably getting on the plane and going to such and such a place to me walking to school in the morning 
is a freaking breakthrough. Like that is so cool. So my wellness, like I started this walk and talk, you know, like I, I was just walking at Mancutha and I'm like, I'm going to walk up there with my girlfriends. Like this is a winning combo. And then we're going to go on a hike to New Zealand, you know? Yes, we are. You know? So I think everything is community based just on the retreat. Um, there was a doctor on the retreat and she did a little thing for us, for the women. And she talked about um, dementia and Alzheimer's. And she said, one of the, the, stu the studies are showing that being in community and connected to other people. So the, the, the whole, like just the science behind that, which is fascinating is that what they discovered causes the Alzheimer's. So it's like this chemical that's there and it starts to degrade part of your brain. However, if you have a lot of different connections, so if I have a whole bunch of ways of interacting with you, Shivani, my brain will have many connections versus like, let's say the one. And so one of those things is about um, talking to your friends and connecting with them. And I'm thinking, I am nailing this brain thing. So mm -hmm. that's kind of cool because I just, my heart wanted it. But apparently the science is backing it up. And the science, you know, when they talk about the longest living communities, like the, these Japanese communities where these oldies still connect and they're, you know, there's, that's really a big part of it. They try to look at the diet and the this and the that, and it's a lot to do with um, connection. So I, the retreat that we just had, I was like, I didn't need to do one other activity. We all did say that we all just could have been together. Now it didn't help that someone made the food for us and cleaned it up and that we got to do Pilates and complain together. We got, to, you know, we got to sit in an ice cube bath together, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, the, the guy, for example, that did the breath work and the um, ice baths actually wrote to the facilitator and said, that was the best group I've ever had because they all supported each other. He goes, that's why they all did it. And I was like, good one. We thought we were the best because we're so cool. <laughs> but it was that, no, we all did three minutes in an ice bath. By the way, every single person was like, I am not doing that. We're like, at this age, why would you do this to yourself? Like, it seemed ridiculous, right? But through supporting each other and through the preparation, he prepared us and everybody was like, I'm doing it for this reason. You know, everybody was really ready and hundred percent. Everyone did it that wanted to do Amazing. it. Amazing. Amazing. That's, so. that's great. I did it last year, but I'm about to do it on Thursday. Are so, you? you know, I am. I'm in Sydney for a health day and a connection with a mastermind group that I'm part of. And then they're like, Oh, we're going to do, we've got a, you know, nutritionist coming and we've got an ice bath and bring your swimmers. I'm like, oh, okay, I've already signed on to it. It's a bit late. Anyway, I'll, we will have, we will. You should do it, Tavani. Everybody else said no too. Yeah, absolutely. We'll do. And Sarah, with the work that you're doing, how do we find you? How do we connect with you? Where's the best place to get hold and find out about some of the work that you're doing? Where's, where can people connect with you? Ultimately, I've been focusing most of my attention these days in the helping department on, I've been really focusing on moms. So my website in the game coaching.com, it leads you right to that. You know, I, I made it like that. I have other things that I do, but ultimately that's the, the desire of my heart. I, I run a six week online program for these moms and I've run it four times and it's been really yeah, really fulfilling. So I would go to my website. I mean, I am Facebook under my name, Sarah Maxwell. It is sometimes you gets hard to find. There's lots of me, but you know, um, and then on Instagram, I've improved. It's a new thing. I, I, I haven't always focused there, but I also have a, the awakened mama. So with um, underscore, so the underscore awakened underscore mama is my Instagram. And that's where I really love to um, give value for moms. So I think that's a pretty cool place to start. Um, and I love the mom work, actually. I think, you know, being able to respect this 
matrescence period, this idea that puberty isn't the only change we go through um, and really honor it and give moms the space they deserve to discover the whole of who they are. I am so down for that. So that's probably the best place. Amazing. I'm going to hold on to you for a couple more minutes, but yeah. I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you for being on here today. So I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm Shivani Gupta, and you've been listening to the Ask Shivani podcast, where I got to ask some questions. Thank you so much for listening. Please follow Ask Shivani on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't done so, please go to the Apple podcast and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It would mean a lot. Thank you.